Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We're going today to begin what we call the quality check. Quality check of uh, the cast we have produced. In general, the features that we have explained in the previous video are present in the paper that you have today in front of you, that you took from the envelope. In this, in this paper, it talks about the ideal features that should be present in these casts. And these features uh, are that a cast should contain all landmarks, they should, there should be a continuous sulcus all around, there should be parallelism in the occlusal plane with the floor, there should be vertical lateral surfaces around the cast, land area should be 1.5 to 2 millimeters around the sulcus, and we should have an accepted thickness of the base, where the deepest point is 1.5 centimeters around, okay? This is the least, but we should have more even. If we're up to two, it's okay. So this is a group of the work that has been produced from the lab last week, okay? So we have all of these casts produced, and we're going to look at them one by one. So we have multiple of the casts that have been produced from last lab, and we're going to look at them one by one at the features that we have in front of us. Okay, let's begin with this one. What do you think the mistake is with this cast? Very thin. Okay, if I come closer and show you the cast, you can find that the base of the cast is very thin. What might happen to this cast? It will fracture. But I want you to notice something, that the thinnest area is sometimes in the pellet if this was the upper. But if we are talking about the lower, the thinnest area is around the lingual sulcus area, which is here. So even if the casts look thick from this side, this is the lower, even if it looks thick from this side and this side, we should not look at the sides of the cast. We are looking at the deepest point. And notice that in the lower cast, we have a very deep area in the lingual pouch. So if you look at this and say this is, okay, more than 1.5 centimeter, this is okay, I would say no, because we should compare the, from the lingual sulcus to the base of the cast. So this is what we say when we say, this is the point we concentrate on when we say the deepest point on the cast, not only the cast itself, okay? So it's the deepest area of the cast that we should maintain the thickness around. So this is thin. Okay. What about this cast? Other than being thin. No vertical. Sulcus. Part of the sulcus is missing. So this cast is missing the sulcus. The anatomy of the sulcus around is not all present. What is the mistake of this cast? One of the features of cast that they should contain all anatomical features. So, what is missing here with over trimming? Can you see the hamular notches? No, uh, even the trimming here had reached part of the tuberosity. So this is the ideal in terms of an, a surface anatomy. You can see the tuberosity all clear, the hamular notches are all there, okay? But in this case, there has been some over trimming of the cast. So the over trimming had lost, we have lost part of the tuberosities. And here we have lost, not the tuberosity, but some of the thickness of the hamular notch, okay? So this is what we say when we say, you have to trim maintaining all anatomical features, okay? So this is over trimmed. About this cast, that we have very thin margins, even before trimming the cast, we know that this cast will not have a land area. The land area is the area beyond the sulcus. See this area where my, in between my fingers? Now it's more clear. See this area? It's very thin in this cast, okay? So this area is very thin in between my fingers. You can see it. It's very thin. I can easily fracture it off. It can break easily. That means I will not have a good land area. So if this is our cast, and we're talking about the land area, which is this area besides of the sulcus. It's outside of the sulcus. So my finger now is inside the sulcus. We're talking about the area uh, lateral to the sulcus. 
So it's very thin. So even before trimming, I know I will not have a good land area on this cast. It will not be continuous land area. So this is why it has not been taught, finished. Okay, we have lost the sulcus here. Okay, this is another case showing better the case I'm talking about. So here, do you see any land area? No. The trimming even reach inside the sulcus in some areas. Okay, that means that this cast has not been trimmed properly and we will have not recorded the sulcus very well. Okay, more the trimming, the over trimming went inside the land area. So we don't have any land area. Okay, so over trimming of the cast. Also notice on the sides, you see these bubbles? Do you see the lumps of bubbles in the base? That means the plaster has been added in a way that it was not continuous with the layers. The layers were not continuous. So we should not trap any bubbles in between the layers when you're doing them. Also other bubbles in the base area. Usually bubbles in the small bubbles like this one, it's very small, it's very uh, shallow. The bubbles in the base area, we don't consider it a lot. But if this bubble was inside the anatomical areas, we would consider it, we might need to repeat sometimes if it's large. If it's small like this, I could just fill it in with new plaster. If I look at this cast, it's very thick, we said, but it has another mistake. If I look from the side, I would see that this cast is tilted, okay? The ridge of the, this ridge is tilted. It's not parallel with the floor area, okay? If I try to trap this between two flat surfaces, okay, let's say that this is the paper that I have, and this is the ruler that I have. You can notice that it's tilted downwards, okay? So the ridge here is higher than the ridge here, okay? In comparison with the paper, which is the, uh, the floor in case of this case, okay, uh, of this uh, cast. So this has not been trimmed with the ridge parallel to the floor, okay? What about this? Look at the sulcus now that it's clearer on the screen. Could you see that the sulcus is over trimmed? We don't have a land area on this cast. We are inside the sulcus. Compare it with this one. Here we have a full sulcus and the land area. Okay, so this is the difference in between them. Okay, this is another cast with errors in the base. Notice that the base here, okay, there is like a V shape in between. See this V shape? Okay, if I'm going to trim up to the land area that I want to leave, I will get a gap here. So when we add the base to the impression, we have to fill in all areas in between the two parts because we added the base later, so we have the first part in impression poured, then the second part the base made. So we have to fill in vertically all of the areas. We should not leave areas that are deficient like this because once I want to trim into the land area with the trimmer, I will get this deficiency in the base, okay? So the sulcus will not be supported. Also, if you look closely at the surface, we will find all morphologies of bubbles that could be present in a cast. We have a very large bubble. The sulcus here is missing, okay? Compare it with this one, going back to this one. You can see the full sulcus, huh? The full sulcus as a valley around the ridge, مثل الوادي. Okay, you can see the full sulcus here. But here, part of the sulcus is missing because we had a bubble in the impression. So from here up to here, there is no sulcus depth. There is a there is a, a plaster where we should have had a sulcus. Okay, the sulcus, by the way, is the same as vestibule. Vestibule and sulcus are the same term for the same thing. So the vestibule here is missing. Here we have a smaller bubble. This bubble was in the impression, not in the cast. So this is positive in the cast. This was negative in the impression itself. So these bubbles that we're talking about here and here, these were bubbles in the impression itself. Okay, so we have a small bubble here. We have a large bubble over the sulcus here. We had a small bubble on the, even the anatomy. You can see this small projection. Can you see it? Maybe it's clearer if I just tilt it like this. See this small projection? 
this plaster went inside a bubble that was inside the impression. Okay? Now, because this has all morphologies of bubbles, this will tell us better, this will tell us better about how to deal with them. If it was a small bubble like this one, I could just scratch it away using my plaster knife or my wax knife. But if it's a large bubble like this or a diffused bubble like this, I could not correct it on the cast. I have to repeat my impression once more. This is why if I have a large bubble in the impression itself, I don't send it to the lab. I repeat the impression, especially if this was alginate, okay? So we finished with the quality check. So this is an, a good cast produced. It has the sufficient thickness. It has all the anatomy there. The hamular notches are preserved. The anterior area is all there. We have the sulcus continuous round, and we have a uniform land area on the side uh, uh, beyond the sulcus that we have, okay? So this is the ideal cast that we should have. For the lower, we're just going to repeat the same quality check. We're going to repeat it all for the lower cast. Same mistakes mainly, but here we have something just different, which is the lingual area. We're going to talk about a bit further. Okay, so let's go through the mistakes. What about this? Okay, if I put my finger here and my finger here, they are about like this. They think this, is, this is sufficient as a thickness of a base. I'm talking about the deepest area here and the deepest for, with the base of the ridge. Try to. It fractured. Okay, so it fractured, and this is what we have. This is the deepest area, and this is the base. Okay, deepest area, the base. So I fractured the cast to show you the difference when we talked about the thickness. So this is the depth of the sulcus in the lower. Try to show it on the camera. Okay, this is the depth of the sulcus. This is the deepest area of this cast. It's in the lingual pouch area, which is this one on the other side, the lingual pouch area. The side, the distal side close to the uh, tongue area. When I fractured it off, see the thickness of the base here? It's very thin. So I'm not looking at it posteriorly. This was the lingual area. I'm looking at the sulcus area. This is what I'm talking about. The deepest area should be more, not less than 1.5. Some references that you will read are talking about 1.2. It's also acceptable, but difference in references, okay? Some references say 1.2, 1.5, and so on. But at least one centimeter is a must, okay? So we're talking about the deepest area of the cast when we're talking about thickness. Okay, so this is finished. Well, I want you to note that when we are talking about lower cast, we have this lingual area, okay? <coughs> This is the area of the tongue, but it doesn't go into the impression because the impression is away from the tongue area. So how do we record it? We record it by the impression that has the U shape. But we, once we pour this area, we have to pour it in a reasonable amount of material. Okay? So this tongue area, we have poured this area using plaster, and it's above the sulcus all around by 2 to 3 millimeters. We have 2 to 3 millimeters above this. We don't pour it excessively like this, okay? This is excessive. I'll show it even here on the groove area, okay? Can you notice that the tongue area here was poured a lot. A lot of material was placed in the tongue area. So it's very high from the sulcus. No, we should usually be only two to three millimeters away from the sulcus, okay? So we don't pour excessive amount of material here. This is in the tongue area. Okay, what about the orientation of this cast? Can you notice? It's tilted. It's very clear. Okay, the ridge is not parallel to the floor. It's tilted. Okay, so this tilt is a mistake. What about the anatomical landmarks? Have this cast recorded the retromolar pad or has it cut from it? It had cut some from it, uh, uh, some, uh, some area. During trimming, that retromolar pad is not all there. So this is overturned. This is another case of overturned. See, the retromolar pad is cut. Not all of the retromolar pad is recorded. So this is an overturned cast. Also, we have bubbles here. 
You might see it if I go laterally. You, there are some bubbles here in the sulcus. This is from the impression. So if we have positive bubbles on the cast, the mistake was in the impression. If the bubbles are negative, meaning going into this cast, this is the mistake of cast material, okay? While pouring the cast, okay? What is the mistake here? Excessive in the lingual area. Overcutting the cast from the sides. We are inside the sulcus here. There is no land area. So this is over trend, okay? This one, I have a positive bubble here, if you can see it. There's a positive bubble here. And also, we have some irregular areas. These irregular areas in the lingual area, they can be trimmed off using using uh, glass, uh, using the bear, and some sandpaper. You can trim it to make it smooth, okay? This is how we trim the lingual area. What other mistakes we have? We have a deficiency here in the cast. The base was not poured continuous with the impression area. Okay? I'm going to show you this just for the case of comparison. When we talked about over trimming, when we said that sometimes we have over trimmed some cast, sometimes it's not over trimmed uh, during cast trimming. Maybe it was deficient from the impression itself. The impression was deficient here. So we don't have the retromolar pad area fully recorded. And above, beyond it, we have this empty area. So this was a fault in the impression. So deficient areas or deficient landmarks, anatomical landmarks, sometimes come from the impression or sometimes come from the pouring procedure of the cast, OK? So these are the quality checks for our cast. Once you have the ideal cast that you have in front of you, we're going to do the following. In front of you, you have an ideal cast. So we have five minutes to revise with your group all points that they are present in your cast. And you're going to go through the quality check paper, okay? And check the quality features in your cast. After that, we're going to do what we call recording your information. So what are you going to do? Four, have four lines beginning from the wide area, four lines. I prefer not using pencil, use a flu master so it will not wipe away while you're working. And on the side here, just on the edge, write the labels. So we have name. Okay, we're going to write your name. University number. Seat number, the where you are seated. And section number. Okay, why do we need these four pieces of information? So when we come and mark your cast, we will know exactly where you're seated and you'll take your mark that is belonging to your work. Okay, other than that, if you look at the window area, do you see these boxes here? So these boxes are for you to deliver your material in. So each student will have a specific box. So if we look closely at the box, we'll find that this box has a label on it. Okay, do you see this label? So this is A, this is for group A. The one who will put his work here is the person seated at seat number 22. Okay? فبالتالي, the code, the letter is for the section. The number is for your seat number. So make sure that you put your material inside the correct box according to where you are seated, okay? We have five minutes now to check the quality of your work on your cast and as well put label each cast for the student containing the four pieces of information that you are requested to do. Okay, five minutes for this step. Impression trays are used to carry impression materials when dental impressions are taken. We distinguish between two types, prefabricated and individualized. In the image above, you see several different types of prefabricated impression trays. At the bottom of the image, we have individualized impression trays. 
The prefabricated trays are factory-made impression trays, made of metal or plastic materials, and come in a host of different shapes for toothed, partially toothed, and toothless jaws. With individualized trays, the dental technician produces an individual impression tray customized to your jaw. In order to do this, a pre-impression is initially taken with a prefabricated tray. This provides the technician with a rough overview of your jaw, from which he can produce the individual tray. This is helpful in the case of difficult jaw conditions, such as large or small jaws, or after tumor surgeries, etc. Now we're going to talk about the gross features of trays. A custom tray could be made of uh, light cure material or uh, cold cure material, acrylic material, and they fit on the primary cast. So this was the primary cast that we made out of our primary impressions from the patient's mouth. Primary casts have been made from the impression from stock trays and th it's not very accurate. Not a lot of detail that we got here. So we need to do what we call custom tray. This custom tray is fabricated over this cast. That means this tray fits this patient only. And the trays come in multiple shapes, but looking at them in general, we have what we call the body of the tray and the handle. The body of the tray extends over the what we call basal seat area, and these are the areas that will be covered by the denture later on. So the body goes all the way to towards the sulcus, but not totally inside the sulcus, but two millimeters away from the border. The handle provides the grip to hold the tray while I'm taking the impression inside the patient's mouth later on. So I need to hold the tray securely in my finger. So this is the handle. And it has the body where it's fused with the body of the tray. And then it has a, an arm that should be clear from the lip and the tongue. It should be slightly angulated, but not interfering with the lip and the tongue. And then it has a handle that the doctor could firm, firmly hold it like this while taking the impression inside the patient's mouth. So from the outside, body and handle, some bodies we will have them perforated. We will talk about the perforations later on. For the lower, the same features. So we have the lingual area free. The tray does not extend to the lingual area because we have the tongue here. It only extends on the ridge, so it has this U-shape. The body has the U-shape, the handle. And some trays have this following feature, which is called finger rest. You remember while we were taking impressions on the, in the lower, uh, we told you to maintain pressure on the impression material all the way, or all the time. Sometimes with the presence of saliva inside the patient's mouth, we're talking about inside the patient's mouth, saliva will let our fingers slip and it will be difficult to hold. So we could add what we call finger rest. And these are just like extensions of acryl on which we rest our fingers while taking the impression. These are called finger rests. On the inside of the trays, we have multiple ways. We could have trays with empty areas nothing there. This is called closely fit tray. We could have trays with relief, which is wax placed inside, and this is called wax relief. And we have trays that have perforations instead of the wax. This is what we see from the inside. For those trays that have a relief, this is also another way for the upper, this is called full relief because it covers all of the anatomy. And this is called partial relief. It covers part of the anatomy. And from the inside, I could see that for the relief, we have what we call stoppers. These are spaces in the wax that acrylic material has filled in. So they will act as stoppers preventing overseating of the tree. So parts from the inside are the body of the tree closely fit and sometimes relief areas and stoppers if we have relief or perforations if we have the perforated type of tray. So these are the part of the trays. If we look closely at the cross section here, this is what spacers provided. You can see that the tray material f f is adapted to the wax and this wax is adapted to the cast. So if we look closely here, you could see that the wax provides space between the tray and the tissue. It's not closely fit. Wherever we have the wax, we will have this feature there.
Now we're going to talk about, in more depth, we will be talking about types of relief and why do we need them. Complete spacer following all of the tray uh, outline from the inside or partial spacer. At the clinical step, we're going to remove the spacer once we take the impression. So the impression is not taken with the wax inside. The impression is taken after we have done a step called border molding. This is the clinical step. These are the clinical steps. So border molding, take out the spacer, and then take the zinc oxide alginate impression. So the cases that don't have any spacer, we will put the zinc oxide eugenol, and this zinc oxide eugenol will be pressed between the tray and the tissue beneath firmly. That means all of the tissue are displaced. But in the cases where we have a spacer, that means once we remove this spacer away, the impression material has some sufficient space inside the areas where the wax was there. This thickness of the material allows it to be static, mucostatic, meaning that it does not press the tissue uh, away from its uh, resting position. So you record the tissue at the rested position. What about partial spacer? Partial spacer means that I'm placing the spacer in areas we call relief areas, areas that we should not exert pressure on for many reasons. While the areas without any spacer will have the tray closely fit to the tissue. So in these areas, the impression material will be squeezed between the impression, between the uh, impression surface of that soft tissue and the tray. So this area will be firmly compressed. These areas are firmly compressed, and these are called support areas. In the areas where there is a spacer, the impression material will have space for it to set. It will not be squeezed firmly between the tray and the tissue, so we will have a mucostatic state of the impression material. So in these areas, we do not have pressure on the tissue. On this cast, you see that the denture bearing area is divided into two parts. The areas that will be compressed, and those are called primary support areas, and the areas that will be relieved, and these are called relief areas. Why do we need not to compress these areas and leave the impression material in a mucostatic stage and not press it as we can do here and here? We need to look closely at the histological section of this, these areas. To understand the issue about uh, compressibility, we need to look at the histological sections of the tissue. We know that underneath what we see in the patient's mouth, there is bone. We have a muc submucosa and mucosa layers. By nature, these layers are compressible. They have some flexibility. They, we can compress them, and they change in location. So when they are resting, they have a position, and once under pressure, they maintain a different position. This is called compressibility of the tissue. If I bring a tray and place it over this mucosa and tissue and press without any spacer, that means the tissue will be recorded at this stage which is the compressed stage. So I'm trying the tray at the beginning like this. Then I place my impression material in between and then take the tray and squeeze. This means that the impression material is squeezed between the tray and the mucosa and the layers beneath. That means everything is compressed and recorded as such. This is called compressed status. The areas that tolerate this way of compression and function with the denture in in this compressed status are what we call primary support areas. And these are the hard palate, the tuberosity, and the 
slopes of the ridges. These could withstand such pressure and recording it under pressure. Once the denture is inside the patient's mouth, these areas can tolerate the denture to be compressed and they have good quality of bone beneath them. They have compact bone. That compact bone can tolerate that pressure. So if we take the bone, submucosa, and mucosa, and impression material, and the tray pressed all together, this is called mucocompressive impression material, and the status of the tray is closely fit to the mucosa before adding in the impression material. And the tissue status underneath is compressed. So that's why we call it tissue compression method. This can be once more done when with a tray that has no spacer in that area. The impression material is squeezed between the tray and the mucosa. The mucosa has some compressibility and the bone itself could withstand such pressure. The posterior area of the heart palate, which is considered as primary support area, can tolerate pressure for a different reason as well. Other than having good quality of bone, and having tissue that is compressible and not very thin, it also has a layer of glandular tissue. This layer of glandular tissue is compressible, and we can compress it in the same manner we compress the rest of the tissue, but also we could either even press it a bit more by adding something called a post-dam area. So even in this area, we exert further pressure, and this is the posterior area of the palate on both sides here. What happens in the case of the presence of the spacer? So this is a tray with a wax spacer in and the mucosa, submucosa, and bone. We take our border molding, see that the tissue is not compressed, and once we're ready to put in our impression, we remove the spacer and the tray Put impression material in here, uh, in the tray, and come and begin squeezing. With the pr spacer preserving the space for impression material, we could not squeeze an, uh, a lot because we also have stoppers maintaining the space. So no matter how much I squeeze, the impression material stays not in a totally compressed status. This is called a mucostatic. Notice that the mucosa, submucosa are not in a compressed status as they were in tissue compressive technique. So this relief that we made with wax maintained a space for the impression material to be, ha to be equal in space, not to exert any pressure on the mucosa while I'm pressing on the rest of the impression. The areas that follow this are in the lower, are the relief areas, crest of the ridge, and the mental foramen area. While in the upper, they are the crest of the ridge, the incisive papilla area, rugi area, and uh, mid palatine raffi area. Now we're going to review reasons why we need to relief these areas using wax. The first reason it is present in the following areas. Around the tuberosities, if they are bulbous, around undercut areas, and in the mid-palatine raffi area. This reason is that underneath the mucosa, the submucosal layer was not thick as, not, as the other areas we have shown earlier. It is a thin layer, and underneath it is hard bone. So if we compress this mucosa like this, and it's trapped between the denture material later and the bone, this mucosa can be easily traumatized because it's thin and the layer of the submucosa beneath it is thin. So these areas, if under pressure, can be easily traumatized under the denture. The second reason why we need to relieve is the presence of bundles of nerves and blood vessels beneath the mucosa. So the mucosa is normal, the submucosa is normal, but there is a bundle of nerves that is going in that er out from that area to supply the soft tissue uh, in the mouth. These areas are in the upper, the incisive papilla area, 
and in the lower the mental foramen where the mental foramen bundle of the nerves and blood vessels come out with the resorption of the denture these bundles come closer to the crest of the ridge so what happens if we press so once more the mucosa some mucosa are normal but this bundle of tissue uh, bundle of vessels that's going out could be compressed so suppose that the denture is going to function and the patient is biting on that and force is exerted on the denture. That will cause this compression of the tissue over the bundle. The bundle is compressed. What will happen is with minor pressure, we will have a tingling sensation. The patient feels uncomfortable with the denture. But if further pressure is ex exerted, pain signals will be like shocking uh, electricity so the patient will not tolerate that pain so these areas are relieved because the presence of bundles of blood vessels and nerves in that area the third reason sometimes why we need to uh, relieve an area is the presence of bone specules these bo sharp bone specules can be present in the form of the mid palatine raphi underneath it we have the bone where the suture had uh, closed and that bone is uh, projecting and in the lower that can be in the areas where we have knife edge ridge so this bo sharp bone specule if present and the mucosa is pressed the tr mucosa overlying it will be traumatized by this bony specule so also those are areas that need to be relieved and Another reason why we need to relieve are the rugi area, areas here. This rugi area is a bit rough. This irregularity in the mucosa layer or in the surface of that tissue, if under pressure, it will not, it will be squeezed underneath the denture and would not tolerate uh, the denture pressure. So we need to relieve the rugi area. The final reasons where sometimes we need to relieve is the quality of the bone. Compact bone has more mineralized tissue in it. So under pressure, with time, it can tolerate all pressures over it. But if we come to spongy bone or cancellous bone, this area is empty while the calcified material is less. That means if I exert the same pressure on both bones, this bone will resorb slowly while this bone resorbs fast. And I will lose the basal seat area and I'll lose the ridge height underneath the denture. And this is traumatic to the patient on the long term. So on the long term, what will have a lot of resorption. So we avoid areas that have spongy bone exposed. Those areas are the areas where we had teeth in the in the dentate patient. So after extraction of the teeth, the alveolar process areas, once they resorb and fill in with fibrous tissue and then bone, they do, don't go back to compact bone. They stay spongy and cancellous. So the bone quality on the crest of the ridges is of ty the type spongy or cancellous bone. While on the slopes, it's the original compact bone that we have. So we try to relieve the crests of the ridges, even if they are not knife edge shaped, because they, on the long term, tolerate the pressure less. That means they will resorb more. So if I exert even pressure all around, these areas will resorb faster because the quality of the bone beneath. So in these areas, we relieve, while on all of the slopes of the ridges, we have compact bone, good compact bone, and we can pressurize as much as possible. So once I understood the different reasons why we re need to relieve these areas in orange, these are all the relief areas in the upper and the lower, we now understand why we need to put a spacer. We could relief in different ways. Putting a spacer and then removing it before impression does this relief. 
or we can fabricate a, a trade that has no spacer in it. But in the areas we need relief, just before adding the handle in, in the areas we need relief, we put in holes. Once under impression, the mater impression material can escape from these holes and the pressure beneath will be reduced. While on the slope area where no holes are present, the impression material is compressed between the tray and the tissue, and we will have a tissue compressive status. So tissue static here, tissue compressive here. If on the upper, we place the holes in the following areas. Once more on the areas we need to relieve, have to relieve, which are in front of the tuberosities, over the crest of the ridge, over the incisor papilla, the rugi area, and the mid-palatine suture area, just before placing the handle. Once we place the handle, we will have the following situation with holes inside, and impression material is free to escape from these relief areas. So we have talked about the quality of the mucosa and the soft tissue beneath the denture. We said that beneath dentures, we have multiple quality of soft tissue and bone beneath them. So if you look at this area, this will have thin mucosa and sharp bone, so we should relieve it. This area has thick mucosa, but very irregular, and they are ob uh, oblique in orientation. So we also need to relieve them. Under the incisor papilla, we have a bundle of uh, blood vessels and nerves that can be compressed, so this is an area of relief. The crest of the ridge, if well-formed, still has uh, under it cancellous bone that is highly resorbable, so the crest of the ridge is an area of relief. If the, sh if the crest is also sharp, we add to that it would have a sharp bony projection. But those are for what we call knife edge ridge. And these, these are more common in the lower. We'll look at them in a moment. Also, if we have undercuts, areas of undercuts are usually covered by thin mucosa. That is easily traumatized. Although the bone is beneath them is good, but the thin mucosa is uh, very vulnerable. So it can be traumatized under pressure of the denture. So these areas should be relieved. While the rest in white of the basal seat area the rest in white are what we call primary support structures. The tuberosity is a secondary support, especially if it's fibrous and firmly attached. This firmly attached tissue, this bulbous tuberosity, could provide good support, but it's called secondary support areas. So we understand that now for a denture to be successful, we should compress the tissue beneath it and make these areas in, in orange all relieved, even under the pressure. So what this is what we call selective impression technique. In the lower, if we revise them, cancellous bone beneath this good muco attached mucosa, so the bone beneath is of poor quality on the crest of the lower ridge. And sometimes, because of the pattern of resorption, we might have what we call knife edge ridge. It has been resorbed from the buccal and lingual a lot, but we still have a knife edge. The quality of the bone hole here is sharp. So this mucosa could be crushed between the hard denture and the bone beneath. And we have openings of foramen. These are the openings of uh, one here and one here for the mental foramen. So also with a lot of resorption, this foramen might even be on the crest of the ridge, and this is an area of relief. Other than that, the slopes from the inside, from the outside, from the buccal shelf area, it's called a primary support area. From the slopes on the lingual, these are all areas of support. In many cases, the places where we usually face undercuts are around the lingual pouch from the lingual distal area. Sometimes we have undercuts. If we have the, the issue of undercuts and bulbous um, exostosis be, before this undercut, it will be covered by thin mucosa and we should relieve them. So these are the areas of relief and support in the upper and the lower. Now, for us to make the, the, the tray not press too much on the tissue while taking the impression, and this is called selective pressure technique, we can do more than one procedure. We could either select the areas where we pressurize and the areas that we want the impression to be static by placing the wax beneath the tray. 
So if I make a tray material, hard tray material over this wax, in the areas where we have wax, these, the tray will not come in close contact with tissue. And once I want to begin my impression, I remove the wax, and the impression material here will have a lot uh, sufficient space. While in the areas of support, the support areas, the impression material will be closely and uh, firmly uh, pressed by the tray and the soft tissue, so these are compressed. While the areas where the wax was, it will be mucostatic, not mucocompressive. Another method is to make a tray without any spacer, but these are supposed to be trays. They're going to be completed as trays, but w just to show you that in the areas where we want to relief, we can place holes in the tray itself, the solid material. So even if a tray comes from the lab to you with no uh, perforations and no spacers, you can add in the drilling of the holes by using bare. And then, the mat while we're taking the impression, the impression material will be squeezed out of these pores or, or these holes, and this will reduce the pressure on these areas. While in the areas where no perforations are there, the impression material is squeezed between the hard tray material and the soft tissue. So this also provides compress tissue compressive uh, properties in areas, and while in the same impression we're doing some tissue uh, static impression for the areas where we have holes. But if we have the case of full wax relief or no wax spacer relief with no holes, what will happen is either all of the impression material will be compressed against the soft tissue and we will have problems later with the compression of the soft tissue in areas, uh, hazardous areas like the nerves, for example, they will have pain in the patient or we will have uh, resorption of the bone in the crest of the ridge or we might have trauma to the mucosa, thin mucosa around undercuts and, uh, and uh, maybe bulbous bone or knife edge ridge. So pressurizing all areas equally could, on the long term, uh, or on the short term, uh, harm the patient. But in the cases where we take an impression with a full relief, we will have that the denture, while functioning, will be put on the tissue while in resting position. So, the, all of the areas covered in wax, once we take out the wax and begin the impression procedure, these areas will all be taken as static. Nothing is compressed in a or recorded in a compressed status. Once we place the denture and fabricate the denture over resting tissue, the denture as a solid material and under occlusal function will not stay solid and it will not stay in its place. I mean, it will not stay in its place uh, while in function. It will be going in and out by the compressibility of the tissue. This extra compressibility or the denture will sink in more into the tissue and once more exert pressure on areas that we should have been relieving. So also the denture could also go through the sulci and go in here and cause trauma to the patient later on. So taking a case where no relief is present or full relief is present are both on the long term hazardous to the patient and might cause harm. So for our purpose, we choose to do partial relief. For your lab work, you will be doing the upper partial relief wax, and then we will place the tray material over it. And for the lower, you're going to do the perforated way of relief for you to have and gain experience in both methods of relief. So for the upper, we're going to do partial relief, and for the lower, we're going to do a whole uh, relief uh, against the tissue that we need uh, to be static. Just a final point about the borders of trays. We are going to use this special tray to do accurate and precise impressions of tissue that aid in the retention of the denture. And these are the sulci and the borders of the denture area. And as well, we will be recording the full anatomical surface, which we call basal seat area, which is the area that is opposite to the denture. So 
to make this in an accurate way and in a precise way, we do it in two steps. Where we add to the borders what we call a green stick material. And after we have finalized all of the border molding, which we'll be talking about next video, and we remove then the wax, we are going to take an impression using zinc oxide hygiene. So to perfect border molding, which is adding green stick to these borders, we need to make sure that we have space for the border molding material. How do we create space? by making our tray short from the sulcus. The tray is not in the full depth of the sulcus. The tray is short from the sulcus by around two to three millimeters. This allows a space for the green stick to be placed inside the mouth later on. So the outline of the tray will be away from the sulcus. So the border all around will be short from the sulcus by two millimeters. We also we need to make sure that the handle can accommodate the lip without distortion. If my handle is going to the outside, what will happen is that it will interfere with the lip of the patient. So we need to make sure also that the handle is clear from the lip by making the first part of it vertical and then we rotate to the outside just to make enough as a grip while holding the and taking the impression. So if the lip of the, pa I'm inside the patient's mouth and the lip is here, you can notice that the lip will be resting without any distortion or movement. So I could hold my tray, insert it, take it in and out without uh, distorting the lip. So this will aid in an accurate impression as well. So to begin for our first step, we need to outline the basal seat area, which is the area that could come in contact with the denture. We begin by holding a pen. We need to know where is the depth of the sulcus. So we hold the pen vertically, and we let it run in the sulcus all around the cast. Okay. We will find that on the areas of free nigh, the pen will go in up and down. And this is the sulcus morphology around a free null attachments. We also go inside the hamular notches. From the hamular notch to the hamular notch, for tray purposes, we make it straight. And then we will change it later on. But as a tray, the tray should be extending from hamular notch to hamular notch to record this area, which we'll be using for post-dam later on. We will be talking about that later. So from hamular notch to hamular notch in a straight manner, vertically in the sulci, up and down on the free nigh area and going to the labial frenum. This is what we call the full sulcus depth. For the lower method, we are going to be repeat the sulcus, drawing of the sulcus. So once more, we put our, line, our pen vertically or pencil, if you colored pencil in your case. So just let that run through the deepest areas of the cast. In the posterior area, we should cover in the tray, inside the tray, the whole of the retromolar pad. In the impression, we include it all together. All the retromolar pad is in there. But in the denture, not all of the retromolar pad is included in the denture base. But for the impression purpose, we need to record the whole retromolar pad because we want then to select the areas we need to include inside the denture. So the impression is a bit longer and more distant than the denture borders uh, in the posterior areas. So this is the outline of the sulcus. The outline of the tray is far away from this by two millimeter. So when I'm going to draw the outline for my tray, I, I should draw the same line, the same morphology of the line, but two millimeters away from the depth of the sulcus. That's why we drew the first line to make sure that we are drawing. We're drawing two millimeters 
to three away from the sulcus. And once more, we follow the same morphology. So if on the free lie area, we have to make these notches. We follow on the labial area. We follow to the labial frenum. And once more, allow clearance for the labial frenum. Run to the other side with the same features. Freni notches opposite to the freni in the tissue. I go behind until I reach the far end. For the posterior area, these two lines meet. We're going to make the tray on the same line it drawn posteriorly. So these two lines meet in the hamular notch area. So the tray should extend into the notch. It's not, it doesn't end on the tuberosity, it ends inside the notch, the hamular notch. So this is our, our outline of the tray. The tray should be two millimeters short and away from the tissue. But once we reach the posterior edge, as we said, the two lines meet. So posteriorly, the two lines meet. Now I'm going to draw on the lingual. for the lower tray. The third step is we draw the outline of the spacer. And here we're following the partial spacer shape. So we're going to draw the line over, we're going to add the lines over the areas that we should be relieving. So mid-palatine suture, just revising them. The rugi area, the crest of the ridge, up to the tuberosity, we exclude the tuberosity. The crest of the ridge, so it's a over and away from the tray border. So the crest of the ridge, the incisive area, the rugi area are included inside these lines. We go all the way to the other side, exclude the tuberosity, and this is our relief area. Now the areas in white between the border of the wax and the border of the tray are all primary support areas. So these are all primary support areas where the impression will be in a mucocompressed status, okay? Except for the tuberosities called the secondary support area. So these are tuberosities are also in close contact with the tray material. I'm not going to do anything on them, but I'm coloring them in yellow just to differentiate them from primary support areas. So whatever in, in white is primary support area, secondary support area, primary support areas on the slopes of the ridges. This is for the upper. Tax relief, we place what we call stoppers. These are openings from which the acryl will come in and touch the tissue inside the patient's mouth so the impression is not squeezed more than required into the patient's mouth so in the wax we're going to place stoppers two in the posterior area and two in the canine area so these are stoppers Once we have our material, material ready, we are going to place holes in the areas where we need to have relief. So the holes in the tray 
will be over the canine eminence, over the crest of the ridge anteriorly, the canine eminence on the other side, the crest of the ridge, excluding the retromolar pad. The retromolar pad should be compressed in denture impressions. So we can apply these holes in the tray once it's there. Now you're ready for the step where you're going to draw the outlines and then consult with your uh, supervisors and uh, helping staff with the outlines that they are uh, sufficient for the purpose. You have 10 minutes to do Uh, for, to make the partial relief wax, we're going to use a wax that has a known thickness. Base plate wax comes in boxes, and it's usually pink or red. This wax has a uniform thickness of 1.3 to 1.5 millimeters. So we're going to use this as our spacer. We're going to do one for the upper. So. We're going to cut enough material for the upper only. And we need to adapt this to the cast. Like this, it's a bit firm and solid. We need to make it soft enough to adapt it to the areas we have drawn. So we're going to use our flame. This is where we ask you please to put on the flames on your benches carefully and make sure that all fire safety regulations that have been given to you in the lab are followed. We heat the piece of base plate wax until it is soft enough that it doesn't hold its weight. You can see that it's, it's going and flowing, and I'm also heating it from multiple sides. This is called tempering, which is slowly heating the material. I don't allow the surface to drip, so the wax on the surface is not dripping. It becomes a bit light in color and pinky. So you will go in and out, in and out. Going in on the temperature heats the surface. When we go out, we allow sufficient time for the heat to diffuse to the inside. Wax is not a good thermal conductive material. So we need time for the heat to diffuse from the surface to the inside. So we heat it gradually. This is called tempering using dry flame. And once it's soft enough, we just put it on the cast and begin adapting it. We usually adapt from the middle first. Adaptation doesn't mean pressing. It's simply just shaping. So I don't press firmly on the wax because if I press more, this wax will become thinned out and I lose the space that I need. So the adaptation means only shaping the wax into the shape of the cast. So it's now fully adapted to the cast without any extra pressure. The even thickness of the wax is maintained all around. And now because I have drawn on the cast using a dark marker, I could see through it. Now I could use my lacquer and carver and begin cutting off the wax in the areas that I am intending to leave exposed for the tray to come in and touch. The areas of the wax are maintained. So follow the outline that I have drawn. Exclude the tuberosity areas. Go around the sulcus, just including the sulci, sorry, around the crest of the ridge and away from the sulcus. I am excluding the surface. And following the morphology of the material itself and the borders. So wherever I have free I might have a notch in the, in the outline of my wax. I go in till the end, stop at the tuberosity area, and I'm going to remove the rest. separate the rest.
you notice that the wax is still warm so after I remove the excess I could still adapt the material even better to the borders that I have placed A bit short from the border area, just a bit short. Then I'm opening the boxes. So emptying a square shape over the crest of the ridge in the molar area and one in the canine area. So that tray material, as it's touching the support areas, it will touch just over here to maintain the space. If these toppers are not there, the tray might tilt while taking the impression and we lose the space we have formulated or made in this cast. So tray material will stop here maintaining the space. And this is the partial relief for the upper. Now you are asked to do the wax adaptation for the partial relief of the upper place. Now we're going to do the step where we're going to construct a tray over this space. For trays, we need them to be hard and rigid. So we use a material that is easily shaped and once it's set, it becomes hard. And the suitable material is acrylic. Acrylic can come in light cure or in cold cure method, powder and liquid uh, mixture. For, uh, for students' purposes, we use the light cure because, because it has an advantage that it's playable for a long time. You can work, you can modify, you can add and remove while still having time and once you have finalized your shape you can light cure it to become solid so it's more it has more working time light cure material comes in a light proof box and this is also sealed with sheets multiple sheets and then we have the material covered up in multiple sheets to protect it so this is called light cure material Make sure the box is sealed and the sheet we get comes in a shape that is corresponding with the shapes of most casts so it has this out form where anterior posterior edges are there it also has uniform thickness so it's although it's like a dough it is it has a uniform thickness throughout so when we are going to do our steps we are concentrating that you once more adapt but not press or thin the material so we're going to adapt the material with our fingers from the palette first then over the crest of the ridge we're simply removing any voids or any air trapped inside and then we run from the crest downwards To adapt inside sulci, we could need the back of a lacquer carver or a back of a wax knife to press the material inside the sulcus and against the tissue in this area. If it becomes difficult, we could follow the following where we simply just remove the axis, the axis of the material from the outside of the land area from the outside of the cast. I have adapted it as much as possible. The material is going over the sulcus. This is the exposed sulcus I have uh, adapted it to. But over the land area, I just removed the excess. So fully adapted as much as possible and then remove the excess. And this excess comes a bit longer so we can fold it into the sulcus once more. So adapt as much as possible. 
and then over the land area just remove the excess and then by the back of the instrument or even the back of a pencil if we have we can adapt this material from the outside to the inside of the sulcus and then smooth it okay we make sure it's fully adapted not pressing it not thinning it we're just doing the adaptation step so we keep the thickness of the material uniform Once we have all of the material in location, we can now, the material is adapted, and now we can cut to the line that we have drawn, which is one to two millimeters away from the sulcus. We're following the line. It drawn one to two millimeter away from the sulcus and we're removing the excess once more. We have the material inside the hamular notch straight to the other hamula notch area. So it's included in the borders of the tray. You can see that we're taking our time because the material it will be stay soft and could be adapted all throughout the time until we light cure it. But that doesn't mean that you work it for, with it for a long time because the light from the room itself might initiate some reaction so it's better to finish it off as soon as possible so this is our tray material added light cured acryl when once i put it inside the light it has it will initiate the uh, polymerization reaction and this polymerization reaction might cause that it shrinks a bit. And this shrinkage or polymerization of the material might take the tray away from the tissue. So there are methods where we cure part of the material first, and we light seal this surface, and then cure the surface alone. So before light curing, we can add any material that is opaque and cut it into this shape and just add it into the palatal area. This will reduce the shrinkage while we are doing the light curing of the material. For the handle, we can take the excess that we had and mold it into the form of a roll okay we press the excess from one side so we roll it and it will have this shape we make the base a bit wider than the upper part this will allow us to adapt the tray handle to the tray body well so, first of all, we made it wider from the base than the uh, tip of it. And we press it like this. So we could adapt this easily to the tray from beneath. Once we have adapted it like this, we keep pressing on the side until the junction between the handle and the tray becomes smooth. You could not see, we don't see any lines between the two material. So this is the first addition. 
So we make sure that from all sides that it's fused, that parts are fused together. Now for this part, we then elongate it. And we can put our finger to make or mimic the lip. So this is our finger, it mimics the lip. We need to make sure that the body of the handle, this part of the handle doesn't interfere because if it was like this, the lip will be pressed away from its location and thus the sulcus will not be recorded correctly. So we need to put our finger in the first two thirds of this to make sure that the lip is not interfered with in the handle. And whatever is remaining, we just flip it to the side and flatten it to form the grip for which the dentist will be from which the dentist will be holding while we cure the material. So we have the body fused to the tray, the body of the handle. This part is fused to the tray all around. There are no, I go, uh, we should not see any lines in between. The body goes up vertically or a bit labially. It's okay, but it vertically is more safe. And then on the last bit of it, it bends to the outside and it becomes flat. This provides a grip for the dentist when he's holding the tray in and out of the patient's mouth. So if this is the patient's mouth in the upper, the dentist has a grip to hold the tray and put it back. And now this is ready to be light cured inside the light cure. But take in mind that sometimes the material, the light cure material you're using might flow back in down. So we might need some support here to be placed inside the light cube. So now we're ready for the light cure. Once we place it in the light cure or wait for it to be placed in the light cure, this is what we said about the handle. Sometimes it slumps down. So we need to put it back and when we put it in the light cure, we're going to uh, support it by something. Another issue is that the light cure acryl material has a, what we call an air inhibited layer. This layer does not fully set on the surface because it's contact with oxygen. So we could add Vaseline to the surface. We could add Vaseline to the surface. This will reduce the air inhibited layer. And also Vaseline will aid in the fusion of the handle to the body of the tray, the body of the handle to the tray material. So using Vaseline, it will smoothen the surface. It will aid in the adaptation of the handle to the body of the tray. And it will reduce or prevent the air inhibited layer. So the material once sets, we will not have the tacky part on the surface. And we have here the opaque layer. This will reduce the shrinkage in the palatal area. And fully adapted from all sides. We also make sure that there are no projections inside the sulcus outline because it's better or easier to remove it when it's soft acryl than in final material. We place it inside the light cure. We might get another cast to, or a, a cup, or any other object, hard object, that could support the handle while light curing the first light cure. Okay. We stabilize it, make sure it's stable, and then we begin our light cure. The time is set. The light cure machine rotates while it's light curing. This will expose more parts of the tray to the light uh, all around. But even with this rotation, sometimes parts of the tray do not become solid. We need, after the first uh, light curing cycle, to take out the, ca the tray from the cast take out the cast and expose the fitting surface of the tray to the light as well. 
at the middle of the cycle I could open this and remove the support I was placing because the support will be preventing the light from reaching to some parts of the, of the cast. As well I'm removing the opaque layer that I placed on the palatal side to expose those areas now and it could continue its cycle. We're going to wait for the three minutes to finish then we are going to open it, take out the tray and the cast, separate them and put the tray alone for the fitting surface. Now that the first cure has finished, we're going to remove the tray, separate it from the cast. If it's firmly attached, we can utilize our lacron carver to remove. This is why sometimes with cases where we have undercuts, we should relieve them with wax before making the tray because the tray is solid. So if we have undercuts and the tray material goes in the undercut, it's difficult for us to remove. But in this case, we don't have undercuts in this cast. So we are inverting it from the other side and we're doing a second cycle of curing. Once removed from the light cure, we find that wax is embedded inside our tray. The tray material covers all of the borders, so no wax is exposed to the borders. The borders are fully cured, the handle is fully cured, and these borders follow the border shape we had in the beginning. And notice that the adaptation of the tray in this case is fully adapted not a lot of shrinkage happened because we covered the palatal area and reduced the shrinkage during the setting. Once we remove this, this is ready to be trimmed, smoothened, and then polished all together. So this is for the upper. We're going now to do the trimming step. For the lower, you have drawn the outline and then the outline of the tray then we're going to adapt the tray light cure material over the tray immediately and light cure it and we're going to place the holes in the light cure material or acrylic base material before curing it it becomes easier so if you had cured it and it becomes solid and you want to place perforations you simply come in with the bare and trim them but it's easier for you to make these holes in the light cure material while it's soft and then cure it. And this leaves us with the tray body ready. And then we add in the handle with some excess of light cure material. So we formulate the handle. Once more, we form it in a roll shape first. Then we press our thumb and begin rotating it against our thumb. This will widen at the base area and thin the outer area. In the base, we place a groove. And this groove can adapt to the cast. In the case of the lower, the, the tray itself is thin in the interior margin area. So we need to make sure that the handle is not bulky over this area. Once more, we adapt it well to the tray. And to make sure that it's adapted well, when we have done the first layer, we don't place Vaseline in this area to make sure that the handle adapts to it. And wherever a hole is covered, we re-expose it to make sure it's still present in the handle as well, with the presence of the handle. So, the handle is in. We thinned it. We have removed the bulk from here. We have removed the bulk from here. We're placing our finger to mimic the lip. And then we go over 
that distance. So we have preserved the lip length, and over that distance, we have bent the handle, and then we flatten it into this shape. So the, it's, the dentist will have a good grip over this area. So once more, if I leave it, it will slump down. I do want to cure it while it's still up. So once more, I begin my curing with a material with support. I could place an old cast to do this purpose. I support my material so it doesn't slump in a manner that we don't want. We do an initial cure. We could wait for 20 seconds or more. And then once they are finished, we can open, interrupt the cycle, and then remove the support. It's still soft, so I'm not going to remove the support. <clears throat> the idea we need to remove the support while it's curing, because the support material will be preventing the light from entering into that area where it's touching. So we need it solid enough, the handle solid enough to uh, take the support away and complete the curing cycle. Once more, now it's hard enough. I could remove my support material and then cure it fully till it's finished. Now we're going to trim the borders. Although we have cut the borders to the line we have drawn, the cut itself is sometimes uh, rough and it produces sharp edges. These sharp edges will traumatize the patient while we're working. So we need to round them out, not reducing the length, just rounding them out. So we're going to use your handpiece that you have. To take in the bear and out, you need to rotate the handpiece, put your acrylic bear in, and then secure it. We need to make sure that bears are secure before working because if they are not secure, they might come out and traumatize you. you go, we're going to use the handpiece control unit that you have on your chair. So you can see here that this is the on and off button. And this is to control the speed. So if I press to operate this, it, it will not work because it's uh, on zero speed. If I raise the speed, Okay, the handpiece will be working faster. You can notice that from the sound of it. So we could put it to the maximum speed, and we're going to use what we call a knee uh, control. So the, my knee, I press it against this large button, and it will operate the material, the handpiece uh, automatically. So I also want to notice, you need to notice that I'm holding with what call with safety grip. So I hold the handpiece with four fingers, and I leave my thumb out to rest on this material that I'm trimming. If I don't have this hand rest, I'm working like this, it might slip away and traumatize me and in any way because it's, it's not safe. Sometimes you're pressing so much and it simply slips away. So we need to make sure this slippage, if it occurs, it is controlled. So we put a finger rest here and we work. So even if this slips away, my finger is preventing further movement. So we need to work with the cast. If I'm doing a border, we don't po point with the bear onto the surface. We put the full length of the bear on the surface. So this is the full length of the bear. And I'm simply running over the border just to remove sharp areas. In the areas where we have a free knife, I open the notches. These are the areas where we had the free knife and the cast. So if I place it now, you can see that for each freenum, I should have a notch in the tray. So this is a freenum area. And this is a freenum area. So we make sure that notches are clear in them. Further smoothing the surface. Going around the border from the upper side. 
going to into this notch and smoothing it and making sure that all of the edges are not sharp you can see my finger rest at all times I'm holding the material the uh, tray firmly I'm just running over the border to remove sharp areas and you can notice from the light color produced that these are now smooth so it's, it becomes an area rather than a sharp edge In our case, because we placed Vaseline on the surface, we don't need a lot of trimming on the surface or any trimming. On the borders, if they are rough and kept rough, not sharp, but a bit rough, these will, this will aid in the retention of the green stick later on. So I will leave these rough borders present, but they are not sharp. They don't injure the patient. They're only just rough enough to hold the green stick into place. Once I'm finished, if I run all around, I should have no sharp edges. There's a sharp edge here that I detected by my finger. So I should have no sharp edges. There's a raised bit here. It's a bit rough, but not sharp. This is where you need your old toothbrush where you can brush away the particles. And then I adapt it back to my cast and make sure that all of the borders are following the orange line here. For this pur purpose of training, I have just exposed a bit more for you to see the lines, that the tray is shorter than the sulcus line in this case. The handle is vertical in its first two thirds of it. Then it goes to the uh, side where I can get a grip. The surface is all smooth all around. The thickness of the light cure material is uniform all around. I have not overpressed it in any way. And this tray is ready for step number two. And it contains the partial relief inside, embedded inside this tray. So this tray is ready. You're going to finish the upper tray only. And for the lower tray, it's just for you to put in the holes before you cure and you're going to train on that. But the submission will be on the upper tray. So you're free now to go in and begin working with your tray.